Welcome to this introduction to the interface of Blender and 3D modeling for 3D printing purposes. So to start off with, we'll talk a little bit about Blender's interface. This that you're looking at here is Blender version 2.79, uh, which is the latest stable release as of the time of recording this uh, video. We're going to make a couple of quick changes uh, to the user preferences, however. Uh, there's a couple of oddities here. For one thing, by default, uh, Blender version 2.79 and below use the right mouse button for selection. That's a little bit odd. Most applications use the left mouse button. And also, uh, the next version of Blender, version 2.80, which is coming out uh, in a few months, uh, is going to be using left click selection and from here on out that's going to be the default the norm so we're going to change uh, Blender's behavior right here first all first off and we're going to uh, make a couple of other changes that will make it a little easier for us to navigate as well so let's go to the file menu up here and click on user preferences and uh, under interface I always like to check these two boxes zoom in a little bit here. I like to check on zoom to mouse position. That means when I zoom uh, it tries to center whatever my mouse is hovering over and also rotate around selection which makes it so that if I have something selected and I tumble my view which we'll talk about a little later uh, it tries to keep whatever I have selected centered. So I always check those two boxes and then under input this tab here I always choose to select with the left mouse button instead of the right then click save user settings you can close this window and from here we'll talk a little bit about the rest of the interface what I'm looking at right here this large window with the cube in it is called the 3D view and that's of course you know our uh, the surface of our monitor is kind of a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional space here so um, you can see that there's kind of a grid down here that gives us sort of a vanishing point perspective kind of view as a matter of fact the description of this view is up here in the top left user PERSP -E is short for perspective so that's a perspective viewport. We'll talk a little bit about why that's called perspective a little bit later. Okay, but I want to show you a couple of keys here. If I tap the N key, it opens this little properties panel over here. If I can, I can uh, open and dismiss that by tapping N. And uh, over here on the left hand side I have this tool palette matter of fact it's got some tabs in it tools create relations animation physics grease pencil display we have a couple of different things in here that we're not uh, we're not going to really explore most of them um, blender can do a lot more things than what we're going to talk about here but uh, basically we need to know that we can also dismiss that panel with the T key You'll see my uh, keystrokes and my mouse clicks are logged down here in the bottom left for this video. So T brings that uh, panel up or it dismisses it. Um, one other thing I want you to pay attention to is this little guy in the top right, this list. This is called the outliner. And the outliner gives us a hierarchical view of all of the elements in our scene. So our scene is kind of, it's sort of jargon for the world, the virtual world that we're modeling inside of. That's, we call that our scene. And uh, in that scene, you can see, matter of fact, here it's even called a world. Within that, you can see we have three different objects. We have a camera, we have a cube, which you're looking at here, and we have a lamp. Um, so if I, uh, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit, you can see that all of these items are visible. Here's my lamp. I can select that by left clicking on it. Here's my cube, and you can see now it's selected. It shows up in the outliner with highlighted. And here's my camera. Now it's highlighted in the outliner. I can also select things by clicking on them in the outliner. So that's kind of handy. Even if something's not on my screen or not visible, I can select it through the outliner. Okay, 
One other thing I want to uh, show you bef as far as the interface goes before we start navigating really is uh, if I open up my properties panel over here and I open the display, I tumble down to the display item here, you'll see I've got this little button called toggle quad view and if you've had any experience with 3D modeling software before you might be familiar with this quad view. This gives us four different perspectives on what we uh, what we're looking at here our scene so I've got a top orthographic view I've got a front orthographic view I've got a right orthographic view and I've got a user perspective view and I can zoom in and out on all of those by just using my mouse wheel but uh, and a cube isn't probably the very best uh, example because it kind of looks the same from three of these four angles um, but uh, it can be really handy to be able to look at different angles of your project at the same or uh, whatever you're working on it simultaneously so that you can see you know, uh, because this is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional virtual space, you can see if whatever changes you're making are actually having the effect that you intend. Okay, so I'm going to dismiss the, the quad view again. I'm going to dismiss this properties panel just because I like to have as much room as I possibly can. And then let's talk a little bit just about spatial navigation. So I kind of just briefly touched on this, but it's worth mentioning again that trying to navigate a three-dimensional space um, through a two-dimensional representation of that space has its own challenges. Uh, you might think that you're only moving something in one axis or another and you might actually be moving in an axis that's not really visible to you. Um, and by axis what I mean is just kinda try to think back and remember your high school geometry You've got X and Y, you know, X is usually uh, left to right axis and Y is usually up and down. Um, and that's true it, for us, if we, uh, if we turn our quad view back on, we look at a top view, you can see right down here we've got this little gizmo, Y and X, and that should look familiar from your high school geometry class, but let's look at a front view for a minute. If we zoom in here, you can see we have X and Z. So from a front view, our Z axis is actually up and down. And Y is pushing away from us from a front view and X is left to right. So we've got three axes to worry about here. And that's kind of what I'm referring to when I say it can sort of be a challenge. We can only really show two axes on a screen. Uh, but we can kind of fake it with like this perspective view for instance. Uh, so a lot of the interface here is designed to help you navigate that issue. Um, so one other thing that's worth mentioning in Blender it matters which window or which view here your mouse is in. So if I start entering a command uh, to select or something like that which I'll show you how to do in a minute and my mouse is not in the 3D view, uh, Blender is not going to select something in the 3D view. It's going to uh, it's going to do something else depending on, you know, if my mouse is in the outliner, uh, that'll act differently than if my mouse is in the 3D view. So that matters and it, it's worth noting. As I mentioned earlier, um, to zoom your view you just scroll with the mouse wheel. So uh, since we checked that little box zoom to mouse position, if I just move my mouse over something else, you can see we now zoom to whatever uh, whatever the mouse is over the top of and eventually since we're in a perspective view we zoom past it. Uh, if I want to pan the view, just move it left to right or up or down or something like that, I hold down shift and I middle click on the mouse and then I just drag drag the mouse. So shift middle click and then move, drag your mouse around and that just pans the view which can be handy. Uh, we can also tumble the view which is to say we kind of 
move things around and you can see I've got our lamp or our light source selected right now and we also checked that little box that said rotate around selection so it's kind of treating that light source as the center of the universe if I select the cube instead and tumble the view it treats that cube as if it's the center of the universe so that's kinda of how that behaves and that's for me that's very intuitive and handy behavior so that's why I check that box okay uh, one other thing I've kinda of mentioned this a little in passing already but this is a perspective view which means if you look at this grid at the bottom here it's kind of uh, it's kind of uh, faking three-dimensional uh, a, a perception of three dimensions by giving us a vanishing point sort of like we do in drawing right we have a vanishing point eventually this line and this line and all of these lines would converge and even though they are not parallel on the screen we look at them and we understand that they are supposed to be parallel because we have the illusion of 3d space here but uh, because we have a perspective on this, eventually they would all converge somewhere back here. And uh, that gives us the illusion of 3D space. Sometimes it's not handy to have that illusion of perspective. And you can turn that off and on by tapping 5 on the number pad. Uh, and you can see that suddenly all these lines really are parallel now. And they, there is no vanishing point. They would not ever converge. Um, the back of the cube is the same size as the front of the cube. It's not trying to fool my eye into a sense of three dimensions uh, by having something that's farther away appear smaller. You know, it's just representing everything at the size that it is. Uh, and that can be really handy for modeling. I usually model in, a, and it's called orthographic. You can see the name of our viewport here is changed to user ortho. So I usually... Uh, model in an orthographic viewport I find that to be more handy okay so uh, when we toggled the quad view we had some named viewports we had top ortho front ortho right ortho and those all refer to the direction that we're facing our object from and user ortho which of course is a tumbled view or a uh, isometric angle on whatever we're looking at or something like that so we can actually get into those same named viewports uh, without the quad view on. And again, this is on the number pad on your keyboard. If you tap 1, it goes to a front viewport. And that can be either orthographic or in perspective. Again, you tap 5 on the keyboard to change that. If I tap 3, it goes to a right view. If I tap 7, it goes to a top view. Now you might notice that back, left, and bottom aren't really included in any of those views. If I want to flip it around, I just tap 9 on the number pad. So if I'm looking at the top, I tap 9, and now I'm looking at the bottom. If I'm looking at the right, I tap 9, and now I'm looking at the left. Front, tap 9, you're looking at the back. So those named viewports can be really handy. And basically what those mean is that you are looking straight down one axis. So right now, from a front orthographic view, you can see I can see Z in the up and down, um, and X is left to right, but Y is totally invisible to me because I'm looking straight down it orthographically, right? There's no vanishing point here, so it doesn't fan out to the left or right. So that's what that means. Okay, now we have an object here, as mentioned, and um, I'm going to show you just a couple different ways to manipulate or select objects. We already mentioned left clicking. We can just click on our objects to select them or we can select them in the outliner. All of those work. Um, there are other ways to select. I can, for instance, select multiples by holding down shift and clicking. Now I have the cube and the camera selected. I can hold down shift again and click on the lamp and all three of those are now selected. If I want to deselect one, I can shift click on it again and now I, I again only have the cube and the camera selected at this point. Um, it's worth noting that there are different colors at play here so there's kind of a dark reddish orange and then there's a bright more yellowy orange. 
So the brighter orange, the yellowy orange, means that that is my active element. So even though I have multiple things selected, one thing is always active as far as like, you know, what what are we looking at the properties of over here, for instance. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to use that active element in Blender with, uh, with multiples selected. So that's just kind of something important to note. That's why the different colors are showing up there. Um, I can select all by tapping A on my keyboard, or I can deselect all by tapping A again. Um, A will always, if I have something selected, tapping A will always deselect all. Um, so that's handy behavior. Uh, I can select with a box by tapping B on the keyboard and then clicking and dragging a box. Or I can uh, tap C on the keyboard and it gives me this circle. I can change the size of it by scrolling on my mouse and then I can, I can use this as kind of a selection paintbrush. And I can middle click to deselect. So that's kind of a handy thing. Um, I can dismiss this command by hitting escape. By the way, that's universal throughout Blender. If I have a command active and I want to dismiss it, I hit escape. Um, I can also select with a lasso by holding down control and right clicking. So that can be handy or not. There are instances uh, in when we get into edit mode, some of these will be a lot more handy than they are in object mode. Um, I can invert my selection by uh, with control I on the keyboard. Uh, there's also a select menu right down here. So you can... Uh, you can select inverse or deselect all if you forget any of these keyboard shortcuts. Um, as far as my 3D view goes here, there's a couple of different ways of viewing my objects. Uh, right now I'm looking at a shaded 3D viewport and you can see that, that it kind of helps give us the illusion of three dimensions with this fake shading on the cube here and I emphasize that it is fake shading it has nothing to do with my light source it's just kind of trying to show us you know that this is this has dimension if I tap Z on the keyboard that takes me into a wireframe view back and forth wireframe allows me to see all the way through an object um, and that can be handy it also allows me to select through an object which will become more um, handy as we get into edit mode here in a minute. Uh, again, that's Z on the keyboard. If you forget that, you can come down here to this little uh, icon here and you can select your wireframe or your solid viewports. And there are a couple of other options in there that are worth exploring. We won't use them in this tutorial. Okay, um, now let's talk about your basic transformations in Blender. Uh, transformations in 3D are um, scale, rotate, and translate. And you would probably usually refer to translate. That sounds a little confusing. Mostly we call it move, moving an object. To move an object is to translate it, and that's, that's basically what we mean in 3D uh, parlance when we're talking about translation. So let's talk about how to do those things. I'm going to select this cube and I'm going to scale it. And I do that simply by tapping S on the keyboard. And that loads my cursor with the scale operation. Okay. So you'll notice, by the way, this center point here, if I tap S when my cursor is near that, a small movement becomes a very large uh, difference in terms of how much it's scaling. And that's kind of how scaling works. Scaling is a multiplicative operation. So if I move my mouse cursor farther away from the center point there and tap S, then a small movement or a large movement becomes a smaller amount of scaling. And that can be helpful for precision. Um, so that's kind of how scaling works. You load your cursor with that, uh, with that tool and then you move your mouse or if you want to be more precise about it, you can actually enter 
your multiplier in on the keyboard. So if I want to double the size of this cube, for instance, I can tap S and then tap two on the keyboard and then just press enter. And now my cube is exactly double its previous size. Let's hit Command Z to undo. You can see, for instance, over here, I've got the dimensions of this cube listed. It is two by two by two. And for 3D printing purposes, by the way, that will show up in millimeters. So this is two millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters. So if I tap S2 on the keyboard and hit enter, it's now four by four by four. So just a little, kind of a second point of reference there. Okay, now if I don't want this cube to be perfectly dimensioned in all sides, I can also constrain this operation by axis. So what's this green axis, for instance? We can look down here, we can see that's Y. That's our Y axis, because it's green. Um, so if I just want to scale this in Y, I can tap S, Y, and then when I move my mouse, it only scales along the Y axis. And then I can also say, you know what, I just want to double it in Y. So S, Y, 2, Enter. And now you can see uh, up here the dimensions of my cube are 2 by 4 by 2. And it is uh, 4 in the Y axis. You may have already come to this conclusion on your own, but yeah, I can also just type a difference in here. I can say, you know what, let's scale this by 3 in Y. And now it's 2 by 6 by 2. Or I can just type dimensions over here and say 2 by 8 by 2. And that will change my object down there. Okay, so I'm going to undo those operations now. And uh, I can also exclude an axis. So if I want to scale along two axes but not the third axis, I can, tap, uh, I can do that on the keyboard as well. So type S to load my scale operation. And then to exclude an axis, instead of just typing that axis on the keyboard, like uh, if I want to exclude Z, I don't tap Z on the keyboard, I tap Shift Z. So Shift Z, and then you can see it is now scaling in X and Y, but it's not getting any taller. It's not scaling in Z. So that, uh, that will work across all of our translations. Scale, rotation, translation, uh, sorry, all of our transformations. Scale, rotation, and movement uh, can all be constrained by axis by typing that axis on the keyboard. Uh, you can type in a, a, a value for those operations uh, numerically on the keyboard. Um, and you can, um, you can omit an axis uh, from an operation by holding down shift and typing that axis. So let's look at rotation next. Uh, scale is S, rotation is R. So if I tap R, then you can see that it loads my cursor with a rotation operation. And it is literally just treating the camera's orientation as if it were the axis here. It's rotating directly around the vector along which the camera is faced. So I don't really want that. That's kind of arbitrary, right? Um, and actually, I'm, I'm using the word camera wrong. I should say my view. That's not really the camera. This is the camera. Um, so if I want to rotate around an axis, I need to type that axis into the keyboard. So R, X, and now you can see it's rotating around the X axis, which showed up there on the screen. R, Z will rotate in the Z axis. And basically, rotating in an axis means that that axis kind of becomes the hinge or the axle around which, the pivot around which your object is rotating. So I can, uh, of course, do the same thing. I can uh, type, a, uh, type a value for this operation. So let's rotate this in X, R, X, by 45 degrees, 4, 5, Enter. And you can see that that's exactly 45 degrees rotated now. So if I ever want to do that, here's the rotation up here in our properties panel. And I can undo that rotation or uh, I can do it in a different axis just by typing it in. So there are different methods of doing that. And again, I can, I can rotate it in a single axis or two axes by excluding another axis just like with scaling.
the last operation, of course, is uh, translation or movement. And we already showed you the T key is taken. So T for translate doesn't work. M is not actually the right key. What you, what you do is you tap G on the keyboard. And I always think of it as grab G. And then that loads my cursor with this operation. It loads my cursor with my object, really. So tap G and my, uh, my cursor's distance from that object will stay relatively constant. You can see there's a little bit of uh, ease in and ease out going on there, but basically that allows me to move the object with my mouse. So I can type the same way here. Let's move this in X by uh, one millimeter, G, X, one, and there we go. And of course, that is also reflected up here. Now in the X location value is 1.0. And I can move that just by typing a new value in here. And I can constrain an axis. Uh, basically it works the same way as the other transformations. Okay, so those are your basic transformations in Blender. S for scale, R for rotate, G for move, translate or grab I like to as I like to think of it. If I want to duplicate an object the shortcut for that is shift D and that loads my cursor with a duplicate of my new object. It's its own object in its own right. You can see in the outliner now that I have cube which is my original and I have cube.001 so that's a new copy. I'm going to delete this by tapping the delete key on my keyboard. That's the delete key that's above the arrow keys, not the backspace key. So tap delete and it asks me, hey, do you wanna really delete this? Click delete, yes. The other way to delete something is to tap X on the keyboard. And it asks the same thing, do you really want that? Yep, I want it gone. Okay, so I can also constrain this duplication operation with an axis. So shift D, let's put that in Y. Shift D, X, shift D, Z. And I can type numerical values. So let's select these three and delete them. Shift D, Y, two. And you can see that that is exactly two units shifted in Y, and since this is a two unit cube, they are exactly butted up against each other. So Shift D, Y, four, Shift D, X, minus four. So positive four would have gone this way, minus four will go the other way, Shift D, Z, four. Okay, and then this is a very precisely placed, you could, you could exactly fit a cube in between any other cube. So, that's exciting if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, I guess I'm the kind of guy who likes to straighten my pencils on my desk, so that, that's, that feels nice. So let's delete that. Um, that's how we duplicate an object. Um, now, one thing, you might have noticed this little kind of life preserver looking guy hanging out here in the middle. That's what's called our 3D cursor. And um, its use and operation can seem a little bit funny uh, until you think about like a word processor. Your cursor is the little blinking eye beam in a word processor and whenever that cursor is when you start typing that's where your text starts to appear. Similarly we can move this 3D cursor in Blender and whenever we place a new object that's where the new object will appear. So uh, since I have left click select enabled, I move that 3D cursor by right clicking. Right click and it will move around. And if I now go over here to my create menu, uh, let's say I want to create a new cube without duplicating my existing cube. Maybe I've scaled this or something and I, and I want a new, a new default cube. So I can click here on cube and it will create a new cube right where the 3D cursor was. Now, until I click away from this cube, I have options for its creation. So, for instance, its location is set here to wherever the 3D cursor was. I can specify 0, 0, 0 if I want that to go back right to the middle of everything. I can specify a rotation, 
and I can specify, it's kind of an odd way to think of a cube, but I can specify a radius for this. So if I click and drag in here, I can say, you know what, I want this bigger or smaller. Those are the options for my cube when I create it. So 0.5, this cube is half the size of the original cube. Um, once I click away, yeah, never mind, it's still there. I thought it would go away. Eventually it'll go away once I, yeah, there we go. Okay, now I don't have any, any further uh, ability to manipulate the cube that way. I have to go back the old fashioned way, but so that's how I create a new object and that the 3D cursor determines where that new object is placed. Uh, so that's something good to know. If I want the 3D cursor back in the center of my scene, I just have to hit Shift S. Let's put our cursor to the center. There. Um, you may have noticed that over in this Create menu, um, there are a couple of different options. So I don't just have cubes, and all of these objects here, the plane, the cube, circle, UV sphere, icosphere, cylinder, cone, torus, grid, and yes, monkey, uh, those are what are called primitives. And I can create primitives for my scene and, and kind of use them as starting points for modeling different objects. So um, let's move our 3D cursor and create, for instance, a UV sphere. And that's a much more complicated object than a cube. Uh, and let's create a monkey. So there's a monkey. That monkey's name is Suzanne. A monkey head. Uh, kind of the blender mascot, I guess. Um, okay, so that's how you create a primitive. And each of these show up over here in my outliner. There's my cube, there's my sphere, and there's Suzanne. So those are, those are uh, basically independent objects, each of them. The reason that's important to know is because I have been in what's called object mode this whole time. Okay, object mode is where I deal with objects as a whole and I can perform my transformation operations on them, I can scale them, I can rotate them, I can move them. But if I wanna come in here and say, I want to make Suzanne's eyebrows thicker or something like that. I can't really do that in object mode. Uh, what I need for that is I need the ability to edit the individual components of, um, of this object. And that mode is called edit mode. So I'm going to get rid of the monkey here because it's a little bit of an odd object to work on this way. And I'm going to select this sphere and then I can either click down here and select edit mode or else I can just hit tab on the keyboard. And now I'm looking at the individual components of this object. Okay, and let's talk about what this object is made of. So I'm going to deselect all by tapping A. My, uh, my controls still work here. You can see that what I can select here are these individual points uh, these are called vertices. Uh, singular is vertex. So this is a vertex, this is a vertex, these are vertices. And uh, vertices basically are the points that make up this individual object. They, they are bridged by edges. So you'll notice this little guy down here, vertices, edges, and faces. So if I, uh, right now I'm in vertex select mode, if I click on this little edge button, now I'm in edge select mode. So I can select individual edges or multiple edges by holding down shift. All of my selection modes apply here. I can tap B to do a box selection or I can tap C to do a circle selection and uh, just paint in or paint out my selection there and then right click or hit escape to dismiss the tool when I'm done. Or I can go into face select mode and faces are basically the flat part like uh, if it's a wall it would be the sheet rock or the, or the, the sheeting that covers the wall, right? And uh, I can treat these the same way. So Depending on what you want to select and how you want to manipulate it, each of those selection modes has its merits. Um, 
So um, I can also view wireframe mode by tapping Z here, just like we did in object mode. And this is where it really starts to get handy. So for instance, if I want to select an identical set of faces on one side or another of this cube, you can see if I tumble my view now, the other side of this, sorry, cube, the other side of this sphere is not selected. Uh, one way to select both sides simultaneously is to go into wireframe mode, and then this is also where an orthographic view comes in handy. Now if I tumble my view, you can see that both sides of this sphere are selected all the way through. And that can be a really handy way to select. Um, so if I've got, let's say I've got a little selection made here and I want to do something with it. I can, uh, I've got my transform operation still available to me. I can rotate or I can scale or I can just tap G and grab or move just these vertices or these uh, faces and I can constrain an axis. So G, Y, and I can uh, specify, you know, a value for the operation G, Y, 2, G, Y, minus 2. Um, I can do all kinds of, you know, mathematical things to them, or I can just use my mouse and kind of go arbitrary and try to be artistic about it. Um, the other things I can do here that are going to be really handy for 3D printing, let's talk about an extrusion operation. So extrude basically means to take all of the edges of whatever you have selected and to turn each edge into its own face. And what that does functionally, if you watch this, is I'll just tap E and that allows me, you can see now I've got this new set of faces right here. Those faces didn't exist before I tapped E on the keyboard. Uh, that's what an extrude operation does. And I can do that with an individual face or with a whole set of faces. And an extrusion operation then allows me, you know, I can manipulate these new faces similarly. I can uh, scale or I can rotate, give them a little bit of a twist. I can do basically whatever I want there. Um, so that's an extrusion operation. Now, if I need more geometry, let's say I want this uh, bridge between these selected faces and the rest of the sphere. Let's say I want that to curve or something. Um, there are ways that I can, I need more geometry to describe that, right? I don't have any vertices between here and here. And in order to describe an arch or something curving or changing angle in any way, I need a vertex, at least one. So I want to basically, I want to put a loop of new geometry in this little section here. So if I hit control R, then that pink uh, preview shows me where my loop cut, and that's what this is called, loop cut, is going to be. And then I have a slide operation. This is called loop cut and slide, and I can tell it where to be. If I just want it to be in the exact center, which in this case I do, I'm just going to hit escape and that makes me opt out of the slide portion of my operation and from there I can move this. I can do a new loop cut in between and escape and I can just kind of say you know what we'll make this just a little bit of kind of a curve and that's like obviously this object is going to win prizes because it is so beautiful. So now you have that. Uh, so that's a loop cut operation. If I just need more geometry overall, I can just subdivide the whole thing. So for that, uh, if I just come over to tools, I have, by the way, I have a loop cut and slide button under tools, and I also have a subdivide button. And if I hit subdivide, you can see the number of faces in this thing just quadrupled. It cut everything in half. Uh, so I can tell it how many cuts do I want to do. I'll do another cut and it quadruples again and every time I do this uh, it creates more geometry. The temptation here can be to really just start subdividing things so that it really gets very precise and nice looking and and uh, that's certainly one method of, of describing something complicated is to just keep adding geometry. Usually there's a better solution though. This starts to get very hard for the computer to uh, 
calculate after you get uh, a lot of after you get a lot of uh, geometry and a lot of complex objects in a complex scene. This right here isn't too bad for this computer, but uh, if you keep going this way, it gets very complicated very fast. For instance, up here you can see now I have 42,000 edges in this thing. So let's undo that, uh, and you can see before I started that subdivision operation, I only had 1,184 edges. So that multiplies very, very quickly. Um, okay, so I also want to show you another selection uh, method that really doesn't apply to object mode here and can be very handy for uh, your edit mode. So let's go and let's see, let's deselect everything here and in my edge select mode, if I hold down option or alt and click on an edge, you can see that it selects the entire loop of that edge until it ceases to become a loop. And that can be really handy uh, if you want to select all the way around something. That'll work in vertex mode, in edge mode, or in face mode. So in face select mode, if I want to select this direction, then I am going to click on an edge in between faces that runs perpendicular to the direction I want the faces. Uh, perpendicular to the direction I want the selection to run. So click an edge that's running this way and the selection runs this way. Click an edge that runs this way and the selection runs this way. So again that's alt click or option click and I can select multiples. Option shift click because shift is our is our multiple selection modifier key in Blender so that's how that works. Anyway, that can be a lot handier than just holding down shift and trying to click a whole bunch of different selections. That's a good way to do it uh, instead of the tedious way. All right. So one note of caution. Um, I showed you how to add a primitive, uh, for instance. If I, I still have my create menu over here. You can see under my primitives I still have a UV sphere for instance. Now um, I mentioned that edit mode or maybe I didn't mention this. Edit mode can only um, only pertains to one object at a time. So if I try to click on this other cube I can't right now. I am editing this cube. I'm in edit mode on this object. If I add another object, let's say uh, okay my 3D cursor is over here so let's say I add another sphere you can see I'm in edit mode on this sphere and there is not another sphere in my outliner. That's because all I did was I added the geometry of a new sphere to this object for which I was in edit mode. Okay, That's what edit mode does. Basically anything I'm doing just adds or subtracts or modifies this object. So this object is now actually this object if that makes sense. Um, so you've got to be a little bit careful about that. I've seen a lot of people try to add another object and what they've actually done is added geometry to an existing object and you have to be really, you, you don't necessarily want that to happen. So I can still delete all these faces and my object is still just what it was before. I can go back, I can fix it, that's pretty easy. But that's an important, uh, an important thing to know. If I want a new sphere that's its own object, I have to add it in object mode. And you can see now I've got sphere.001. If I want to rename one of these objects, by the way, I can simply double click on the outliner and I can call this sphere for world piece or, you know, whatever name pops into my head. And this one I can call major artistic achievement. Uh, because obviously it is an artistic achievement. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, the last thing I'm going to show, uh, last couple of things I'm going to show is I'm going to show you sculpt mode. Um, so a lot of people don't like pushing vertices and faces and edges around. Uh, we've been in object mode, we've been in edit mode. If I go into sculpt mode now, um, I actually have some tools up here.
you can see I've got sculpt draw, I've got grab. Let's try a grab operation. And just like in Photoshop, I can increase or decrease the size of my cursor here with the bracket keys that are kind of under the backspace key. So I can grab this stuff and just kind of start moving it around and just sort of make my sculpture this way. Or I can put a blob in or you know, click on things that uh, I can pinch. Or I can rotate. Uh, smooth is a really handy operation. I can smooth out the transitions between areas. Um, you, c you can kind of see that I'm a little bit limited here in terms of how much I can sculpt this thing because it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't have a lot of resolution, really. I mean, in terms of a sphere, this is a pretty coarse object. So if I tab back into edit mode, select all, and I subdivide this thing, let's give it some more resolution. Then I come back into sculpt mode, and I start playing around with my smooth operation. You can see that this can get much smoother now. Uh, or I can add clay strips to this thing and you know, fill or deepen. I basically I've got a couple of parameters. I've got the strength of my brush. I've got the radius of my brush, which again I can also adjust with the bracket keys over here. But the strength is important. If I turn the strength all the way up, it's usually a bit too much. Uh, but you know sometimes it's not too bad. So one other thing to note, if you look you'll notice that everything I'm doing here, let's get something a little more obvious, inflate. Everything I'm doing here is happening on both sides of my object. And that's because if I twirl down this symmetry slash lock thing, it's set to mirror in X. If I turn that off, now I'm no longer uh, staying symmetrical in terms of my sculpture. I can turn it back on. I can say, okay, but I can choose which axis to mirror around. But basically, um, that's just important to know that you can turn that off and on. It can be handy to start with and then, you know, keep things symmetrical and then turn, them, turn it off later if you want. Um, okay, so let's say as uh, I think is probably obvious at this point that I am going to consider this object to be my artistic magnum opus and I just really am ready for the world to see it because it's so amazing and so awesome and uh, So I'm ready. Uh, I'm going to go back into object mode. I'm going to delete this sphere and this cube. Whoop, this sphere and this cube. Holy cow! There we go. And uh, I want to send out a picture of this. So first of all, I should probably light it. Again, I've got a camera object here. If I want to look through the camera object, I tap zero on the keyboard. You can see I don't have a very good view of this. Uh, object yet, but I can move my camera just like anything. So tap G and then kind of move it around. My camera is selected when I do that. I can also tap Shift F and then I get these WASD kind of video game controls to move in and out and that's sort of handy. Okay, so there's a good view of my object. Tap 0 on the keyboard to move out and uh, I really need to probably light this object. So I'm going to look at down here where I selected wireframe or solid. I'm going to look at a rendered preview. And uh, I'm going to select my lamp and I can see that that's pretty dim. So I'm going to turn my lamp up over here. And I can also Let's see. Where is my lamp? There we are. I can also move my lamp around. 
change the type of lamp that it is. Let's look at a rendered preview again. Okay, and that obviously is it. That's that's artistic nirvana right there. So once I've reached the point where I'm happy with that, I'm going to go over here to my render tab and turn this uh, scale thing up to 100%. You can see I'm set to render at 1920 by 1080. And then I just click on render. And there's my object rendered. Um, so now I could just click on the image menu and I can save that as an image. Um, so let's hit escape. If you haven't done so already, you'll want to save your Blender file. So file and click on Save As and save your Blender file somewhere. The other thing to note is if you want to 3D print this object, um, first of all, right now it's important to pay attention to my dimensions. This object is only a few millimeters across. It's really, really tiny. So I might want to end up scaling it by like 10 times or something. So now it's like 35 millimeters across in Y. And anyway, that's a much larger object. You can also do that in your 3D printing software. But if I want to print this, I'm going to go to File and Export. And I'm going to export this as an STL. And if I export it as an STL, most 3D printing software can actually import an STL. So that's sort of a handy thing to know, and basically that should kind of roughly get you started uh, with Blender and 3D printing. So I hope you, uh, I hope all your wildest dreams come true.